Aries all. All right, so uh, we're going to go into uh, into 5B right off the bat, Housing Committee. Uh, there's a staff report in regards to this Housing Committee and why we should have it. Uh, Scott, can I get you to uh, comment on this? Yes, thank you, Chair. So um, in just a little history, in 2009, there was a, a standing committee formed um, probably at the, the discretion. Um, at that time, there was an affordable housing committee and uh, an affordable housing strategy. And uh, I don't believe very much has happened in, since 2009. Um, staffs put together uh, terms of reference for a, a housing committee um, with some of the, the things going forward. So we have that housing needs assessment, which we should have uh, by the end of this year. And then with opportunities for the Elk Valley Housing Society, BC Housing, Habitat for Humanity, um, some administration that's going to be required, and um, and, a, and a committee would be the the group that would offer advice to council or other administrators. Um, so yeah, we've just put together terms of reference. Um, more for discussion today. It's uh, we don't have a resolution attached, but uh, if. Um, Council would like staff to do more work on it. We can do that. Um, and yeah, really, it's an information item today. Okay. Comments or questions? Councillor Anderson and Councillor McCabe. Um, just a question during the assessment. How many attainable housing units do you think Sycamus needs? Like, do we have the number? The chair, we we don't necessarily. I don't have that number right now. Um, we probably have some results of a survey, but uh, yeah, we're we're not quite there yet. I think we're looking at probably the end of end of November before we have that housing needs assessment put together. Okay, thank you, Councillor McKay. I I just wanted to make a comment that we have. Um, some of this was prior to uh, not last last term of council, but the term before. So about three councils ago, that this was recommended, I guess, in 2009. But since then, uh, this current council has established a line item in our budget for housing, I believe, if I'm correct, uh, through the chair to Kelly. We do have a line item in our budget for housing now. Um, yes, through the chair, we do actually have a reserve that we've established for housing. Yeah. We contribute to that annually. Yeah. yeah. I think for two years now, I think it's been going. Yeah. I just wanted to make that comment. So what staff recommending is recommending uh, three council members and three members from the community. And uh, uh, I attended a meeting with the planning committee and uh, and the housing needs assessment uh, and the committee and, and what uh, their roles would be in there is terms of reference, as you can see in here. And, uh, and the requirement for it, and as we, uh, as we face the, the town hall meeting on November the 3rd, an assessment and a committee and, and, uh, and a strategy when it comes to affordable housing based on the committee and the members of the community, I think is quite well required. And I think uh, um, it's all laid out here and, uh, and it'll be up to staff in order to another meeting, but uh, Councilor Malmas and, and then Evan. So at the council meeting where we released all the Habitat for Humanity and uh, homeless and all that stuff. Didn't we already vote three council members oh, we to a, uh, a board for that affordable housing? And would it not make sense to have that same three carry forward onto this? And my other comment is, is that committee comprised of three members of council and three members of the community at large for term for two years appointed by the mayor. Well, who's going to be here next term? So 
I think somewhere in that wording, because uh, if you're not a counselor, I don't think you'd be able to stay on that board. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying that, you know, it made sense if you've got this going right at the start of the term or exactly midpoint, but at this point, there's less than 12 months left in this term. Sure and enough. I'm counting the dates, by the way. Councillor McGee. Yeah, I agree with Councillor Momus. Uh, this could be just tweaked to say, you know, a one-year term because the other documents also need reviewing because, um, you know, show me a house for 190000 I'll buy one. Yeah. Two. <laughs> or two, yeah. Even for, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the intent is here, but I, I thought we did already have three, three councillors appointed on a committee, and so there's a bit of an overlap in this process here, but maybe those same councillors could just jump on this. Roll into this committee sort of thing. Yeah. I think we've already, there's a bit of an overlap here, yeah. Evan, your take? Um, um, to the chair, uh, to the previous question on, do we have a number um, in terms of those that are seeking housing? Uh, just a reminder in 2018, the district uh, and Eagle Valley Senior Citizens Housing Society submitted a grant to BC Housing. And we had to provide that information on what the demand was for our community based on not just anecdotal comments, um, but also existing studies. The Manor, the Lodge and the Haven uh, identified a need for up to 40 units of housing as required. That's the waiting list at the mm -hmm. time. And that was conservative. And so when we applied for that grant, uh, that was uh, noted in the application that the current waiting list for the Manor, Lodge and Haven run by Eagle Valley had a waiting list of plus 40 and we received funding for 36 units. So just a reminder, it's not a complete picture, but it does um, address that question at that point in time in 2018, when asked, what is the immediate demand in the community? Thomas? So um, I'd just like to make a recommendation that the three councillors that were appointed to the affordable, or to the um, Habitat for Humanity, probably be the same three councillors that are appointed to this and that we search out three community members that would at large that would like to participate. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm just looking at the strategic priorities list and, and uh, the councillors that were selected and, uh, and uh, uh, item five, uh, to the support of affordable housing projects um, and, um, and item three, um, the development of community health and, uh, and pretty much the counselors that we've got in place are pretty much aligned with uh, our, our uh, strategic priorities list as well. So uh, that recommendation probably would take place. Scott, do you have any more uh, as far as commenting on this and, uh, and the need for it? more so than, than, um, than the actual format. No, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. The, um, yeah, the terms of reference was put together by staff. It's, it's up to the mayor to, I think, form this committee and uh, definitely a need for it because we, there needs to be, uh, just with some of the, the housing out there, um, one, of the, one of the conditions through BC Housing is that there be a committee to, uh, to administer that housing. Yeah. And other municipalities have these committees in place because the housing is becoming a, a very hot topic throughout Canada. And uh, I think this committee needs to be formed. Uh, how are we going to go about um, uh, getting it out to the public uh, as to um, having people step up that might uh, be from the public that would join this committee? Um, I, I haven't put much thought to that. I think we'd probably just uh, put an advertisement in the newspaper, run it for, for two weeks, use our social media. We have an opportunity next week to, to reach out to people. So I don't think it's, I don't think we're gonna have a hard time filling the, the spots on the, on the group. Perhaps some of the existing, um, committees or existing societies in town that uh, 
that run this kind of thing might be interested. Um, I don't think we're going to have any trouble finding people for it, though. Okay, thanks. Thoughts, Rick? I think we have like three main nonprofits in town <clears throat> the Valley Seniors Housing Society and um, the Valley Community Support Services. If we ask each one of those nonprofits to put a name forward, okay. and that could represent a a good cross section of the community and and the seniors uh, senior center, their nonprofit society. So those three nonprofits, they're suggesting three counselors and three. So if we reach out to those three nonprofits and ask them to put a name forward each, that should have a fairly decent cross section of the community. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Anything more on this? All right. Thanks. Then we'll move on. I'll leave it in your hands, Scott. All right. Uh, Finison boat launch. Finison boat launch upgrades. Okay, Daryl, report on this, please. Sir, through the chair, uh, we've got a, a notice ready to go out public. I believe it's in the queue to go out, but it hasn't gone out quite yet. But um, basically, what we're what we're saying is a little bit of background on the project. We've we've had this capital project funded and in place for a number of years. In 2017, we took a run at getting the permitting for the, the complete renovation of the boat launch down there. Um, and you know, as, as the, the release alludes to, there's, there's a lot of players involved. There's archeology span to deal with and Flynn Row and new bridge on Highway One being built, there was a lot of considerations and a lot of interest and a lot of competing demands. So we we didn't uh, get the 2017 permit uh, approved at that time. There was some reservation by some of the parties, so we took it back. Uh, we took a step back and we regrouped and decided to do this in a phased approach to get the ball rolling. Uh, so we've been working since the spring in, in getting the permitting in place. And so this is a little bit of a good news story in that uh, we have our approval now to go ahead and get going on the Finlayson boat launch, which is, which is huge. We've got the old uh, Federated Wharf that's rotten and has been sitting there for years. Uh, it's, it's been an onerous process just to get permission to get that out. So we're approved to get that out. Um, Mackie Square is, will also be removed at that time as part of the overall renovation of the boat launch down there. It will be profiled uh, very close or, or the same as the existing boat launch next to it. And then there will be some in-stream works that need to be done as well with some, some divers that have to cut some piles and uh, a few moving parts with it. But we've got, we've got phase one underway uh, November 1st, and they should be working for about three weeks to get in and get out. We'll put some temporary measures in place so the area is still usable and we have a dock that, uh, that is functioning. So that once we get this done, we'll be working on the next phase to advance it further. Awesome. All right, comments or questions to Daryl? All right, thanks, Daryl. Yeah. Great. Good one. Good job. Good job. Um, Sorry. Hey, uh, we're going on to D Main Street Town Hall meeting. Uh, Evan, you want to comment on this? Yeah. Okay, sorry, Jeff, I missed you. Would you go ahead. So yeah, good job, Daryl. Um, so you at this point in time, you're just removing the old structures because um, you know when we talked about this a few years ago, we we're going to put in a, a piling structure so that the water would flow through there. Has there been any work done towards that end of what will go in there to replace? I know you're going to put in a boat launch, assuming similar to the one that's out in Old Town, and and but there's been no conceptual work done on what I, I would the replace. Yeah, sorry, through the chair, I wouldn't I wouldn't say there hasn't been any conceptual work. There is some conceptual work, but as we move in the next phase, it'll be. Engaging the stakeholders that are have vested interests down there, and uh, and just refining that design and, and having having the input from the players that that matter and that have a say. Um, well, um, through the chair, if I might be so bold, but 
I think that one of the matters that makes a big difference is what does the District of Sycamores want there? Not just the local business that's there and somebody else. Like that, that thing you're removing actually had some landmark references on it to what was across the channel at one time. So I think that the District of Sycamores this council needs to be somewhat involved in what is the replacement down there for what its character and form is going to look like. So to the chair, that's that'll definitely be the process. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna be having some workshops and, and getting what we need of, out of that. Perfect. Program. And I, I knew that I just needed you to tell everybody that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Daryl? Go ahead, Kevin. Just want to add so in addition to the design of the finless and bone lunch we have received a request through the dev court from search and rescue sar 109 saying they need a uh, looking for a new home for a boathouse they currently do not have a boathouse where they can um, store their uh, their their fleet um, they've approached the dev corp to look at solutions to find a home on the channel and one of the options is us the dos working with moti on the bridge project, the Brune Bridge project, to see if we can do a partnership and find them some potential tenure space, either on our public wharf or the Finlayson boat launch. And we wanna protect both uh, assets to make sure that they're accessible to the public. We are also looking at a, a potential partnership to find a home for search and rescue. So that's another community benefit um, that hopefully can be incorporated in an in existing tenure of which the, the district could facilitate with a potential partnership with MOTI. I've reached out to MOTI and it will be on the agenda when we meet with them on November 12th to discuss an update on the Bruin Bridge project um, and see if they can uh, throw their support behind uh, giving up some, some valuable tenure to potentially house this facility. Details are sketchy, but we're looking into it. That's another public asset. All right, thank you. Any other comments or questions on this? All right, here are none. And we'll move then to D, uh, Main Hall, uh, Main Street Town Hall meeting. Uh, Evan, you want to comment on this? Yeah, so Mr. Mayor, um, staff have received um, several, several emails and inquiries, both by phone, in person, and, and via digital platforms on what is being proposed on Main Street, um, what is being proposed in terms of affordable housing. Uh, what does the shoe shop healing center entail? Um, um, what, what about uh, this new venture habitat humanity cam loops? Um, what does truth and reconciliation um, have to do with these proposals? Um, and what is a community health center? Um, what is the status of the existing community health center? What is the status to build a new community health center? And where are the locations to be considered for both facilities. Um, when you look at all this work and you look at also the Main Street revitalization and all the infrastructure works that we have budgeted for Main Street, there is a lot of interest from the public. And so as promised, um, we felt at the staff level that we, we have listened to the public and that we need to meet as a community. Now it's tough because of COVID to bring people together in a gymnasium where we can allow seating up to 300, 400, and have an interactive discussion and some Q&A. So we are limited with COVID. We can, no we can no longer have more than 50 people in the building. So we've scheduled Wednesday, November 3rd, a week today to have two concurrent sessions, three till five for those that cannot make an evening. And we'll also do a repeat six till eight. The makeup of this town hall meeting is to have an interactive display. We're gonna have six different stations explaining the Main Street revitalization, the Shoe Schwab Healing Center proposal, truth and reconciliation, partnership with Splatson, affordable and attainable housing projects, both Eagle Valley Senior Citizens Housing. We're having the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity, Bill Miller attending to discuss what they are proposing to enter into partnership with the district on attainable housing. We are gonna have a station talking about our beach park improvements and update the public on what we're have done over at Beach Park, and I invite all members of the community to check out what we've done so far. Uh, kudos to the construction team and Public Works for really improving that asset for the community. We're going to have a station talking about community uh, green space and parks, 
A lot of folks want to make sure that we maintain our parks. And of course, we're going to talk about and have a station on this community health center. And this is the, this is the former Sycamus Medical Clinic. This has been a big, bold move that this council has embarked on, and it started in 2017 when we started the effort and the commitment to recruit a doctor, a physician. This council knew that Dr. Beach, after 42 years, was going to be retiring, and I have to commend council, and I think that's forgotten that this group decided to pursue not only doctor recruitment, but to maintain our clinic. And if you follow the news, a lot of communities, and most notably the district of Peachland, they've lost their clinics because physicians have retired. And a lot of people figure, well, you just pick up the phone to Interior Health and a new clinic will show up. And that's not the case. So some communities have considered this health issue to be a provincial responsibility, which it is. It is a responsibility of the province to provide health care. But IHA's and the province's answer is regional support. And you have a hospital in Salmon Arm, you have a hospital in Vernon, and we consider your health needs met. This council has said that's not good enough. So they went and purchased the existing medical clinic in 2017 um, in the hope to recruit doctors and control the process and offer incentives for new physicians to come and locate to Sycamus. And we've done that. We've achieved that. So we're going to be talking about all that stuff on Wednesday, November 3rd, and what that means as we transition to a new community health center. And this new community health center is going to be open to everybody, and it's going to be welcoming Indigenous, non-Indigenous people, and it's going to be focusing on the specific calls to action of truth and reconciliation, which we will also talk about on November 3rd. There's a lot of questions on that, and they're fair questions. What does this facility mean? What kind of services are going to be held? I keep being asked by a lot of folks that they figure this is an addiction center. And I think we've addressed that, but we're going to address that again on November 3rd, that it is not an addiction treatment center for anyone. The private sector currently offers that. First Nations Health Authority operates uh, addiction treatment centers for Indigenous folks through their mandate. And so we're going to have a station. We're going to have a Q&A opportunity. People can grab a mic and ask a question and we will answer it. Um, we're going to have as many people there answering questions at these six different stations. So I invite all the public to either Zoom in on November the 3rd, either from 3 to 5, 6 to 8, or both, or drop by. We will endeavor to get you in on one of those sessions. Um, we're going to try our darndest without breaking COVID rules, but be mindful that we have to follow the PHO. We all know what the rules are, no more than 50, and we will endeavor to have everyone in person attend that interactive display and ask all these questions. So in, in, in final note, um, the public has spoken that there's a lot of unanswered questions on what's going on Main Street. Hopefully this can be one of many. It doesn't have to be the final uh, information meeting or town hall. We can have others, but we want to make sure that all the questions are answered and understood why we're doing what we're doing as per our community wellness plan overall. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Evan. Other comments or questions from council at this stage? Councilor McCabe, go ahead. Sorry, can't help but uh, jump in there. Thank you for all your comments, Evan. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so just to repeat, it's it, uh, Shoe Shop Healing Center is not an addiction center. It, it's, it, it's not uh, an injection site. There's no accommodations for sleep, uh, overnight stays if you will it's it's a regional regional healing center regional health center and uh, I, i'm looking forward to um, november 3rd I'll from uh, our from our consultant team to help answer any questions about how we're going to run a community health center sustainably and and what the healing center means to our whole region uh, we're very, we're in a very fortunate position to have six million dollars, have a piece of property to be able to do this. Uh, I'm sure we're the envy of a lot of communities. See, we're being, like Evan said, we're being proactive to not only maintain community health center in our, in our community, but also have it in a brand new facility. 
Any other comments or questions? Councilor Anderson. Just to add to that, um, we've been, Sycamus has been asked to share their plans with other communities as well. So we are, we are trendsetters as far as uh, the uh, healthcare center goes. And the other, my other concern with the um, um, open house is, are we putting too much in one day? Should we, like, is, there's a lot of information in this. So I guess my concern is that we're, we're we might be putting too much in and is, are people going to have enough time to absorb and walk around and should we have a backup date too or something set up another date so that we can make sure everyone is is uh, informed Go ahead. yeah the short answer is of course i mean this council and and the public um need to know exactly what is being proposed and and um, the consultants that we've hired are going to go through that if november 3rd is well attended which i expect it to be and council and staff need additional town halls to be scheduled we'll schedule them we'll have another one in december we can have one in november um, my my objective and my promise is that every question will be answered and so if we need more time this is the first of many We'll go through the other conventional social media platforms we use to communicate, whether it's the newspaper or the different platforms there's available online. But you know what? At the end of the day in a small town, nothing beats one-on-one. -on -one. It's just that we're restricted with COVID. And because of that, maybe a second and third town hall, uh, most notably, will be scheduled. Councilor Malmas. Um, I'd just like to make a comment that <clears throat> There's a lot of questions about this, and uh, thanks to the staff for putting it together. Um, but I'd like to make a comment, basically, that you know, if you attend the three to five, don't go out the door and come back to the six to eight. Give give other people an opportunity to do that. And based on staff and 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 probably comments to make to staff, uh, if all the questions didn't get answered or all the people that wanted to attend couldn't get in because the restriction of 50, you know, maybe there's 80 at the door. I don't know. I have no idea, but that will determine if we have another one, but let, let's not have the same 50 people show up at three o'clock and the same 50 show up because they just stand outside the door waiting to get back in again. So uh, if that could be possible. Thanks. All right. Any other comments on this? I think from my perspective, Effective on this uh, town hall, Main Street developments, um, serious decisions made by council, uh, some serious uh, concerns from the community, <clears throat> need for the town hall meeting. And uh, once again, three to five and six to eight on November the 3rd, Sycamus Senior Center, that's on Shuswap Avenue. You can zoom in. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about Main Street revitalization, uh, the healing center, the affordable housing projects, the Sycamus Beach Park improvements and community green space, and the uh, Sycamus Community Health Center, which was uh, formerly the medical clinic. So please attend if you have any concerns at all. And uh, there will be six stations, as Evans mentioned, and uh, and uh, we're going to have also some speakers there on behalf of the Healing Center and be on, and on behalf of the housing projects. And uh, what this has triggered uh, was in earlier conversations today, uh, based on uh, staff, uh, our planning committee, uh, formulating a housing committee which will assess uh, housing needs in Sycamus. And uh, let's face it, housing needs in Sycamus is absolutely essential. We wanna build up a workforce and so many young people that uh, are actually working in some of the uh, businesses in Sycamus have no place in order to live here, especially affordable living accommodations and 
if we're uh, going to build up a workforce, we have to get uh, some housing here as well. So we also had uh, three and a half acres of land that we've allocated, which the District of Sycamuse has gone out and purchased. And, um, and that's uh, what we're trying to allocate here in order to accommodate these particular developments. But um, please join us at the town hall meeting. Thank you. All right. Uh, strategic priorities, uh, comments uh, from councillors at this stage in regards to strategic priorities. Any comments? All right. Councillor Balmas, go ahead. I just have a, a question on that strategic priorities portfolio. Um, I thought there was going to be a late item added to the agenda to do with the biofuel. Did that actually get added on here? or? Uh, I think we agreed that it could be brought up during strategic priorities. So now it'd be. Hmm. That would be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, just for clarification, the reason you don't see it on this strategic priority, it's on the DOSDC strategic priority, but it's the same owner, and that's the DOS. So, um, with the bioheat facility, you want me to start, Councillor Mullins, or you want to start? You don't mind, I'll. Sure. So, so the biofuel came to council, and and council voted against it, and and I had a lot to do with that. Um, the reason being is we did not have enough information to make an educated decision. And was there going to be a cost to the taxpayer in the end to own this facility? So we got some new information. And so I'd like Evan to explain that portion of it and what the thought is. Thank you. So through the chair, um, another project that has been on our strategic priority now, approaching almost five years. In 2000, late 2016, um, Urban Systems, who was one of our consultants, brought awareness to us that a federal grant was available aimed at reducing the carbon footprint, reducing GHG emissions at the local level. Although this is a global issue, and it is probably the issue facing uh, the globe itself, and that's climate change and, and GHG. Uh, the governments of both BC and the federal government have said to local governments, we are allocating some monies for you to reduce your footprint, albeit small and albeit uh, a drop in the bucket, if you will, when you compare to the total output of, of carbon. Um, we applied for a grant through Natural Resources Canada, which assists rural municipalities that don't have natural gas. And it's, it's a program that basically says natural gas is a fossil fuel, and we want you to seriously look at other sources of heat and other sources of energy moving forward to reduce your carbon footprint. So we applied. And we applied for a program that provides heat, not energy. So this is not power grid stuff this is just um providing heat outside the fossil fuel grid to either businesses or residents to reduce the overall consumption of carbon so how this works is they provided us eight hundred seventy-five thousand dollars to go ahead and purchase a boiler which takes wood waste and converts it to heat in addition to that we also applied to clean bc for a grant of 660,000, of which the district commits 176,000 to assist in the cost to build this bioheat facility. And a third partner joined, and that's the Fraser Basin Council, who looked at our proposal and said, you know what, we're interested, here's 175,000, go ahead and build this boiler. So the question became where to locate the boiler. Now, as the public knows, the district of Sycamus has also been in discussion with Fortis because one of the big deterrents to economic development and landing business is that we don't have natural gas in this community. We're one of the very few rural communities without natural gas and people have no choice but to either go electric, propane, oil, wood. And so we are continuing discussions with Fortis it's a very complicated process. It has to go through a bunch of regulatory approvals. 
with the BC Utilities Commission, but we are desirous to bring natural gas to our community one day. And when I say natural gas, it's the new natural gas. It's called alternative natural grass, gas. It's called a green energy. And they've got um, all kinds of different options rather than conventional natural gas. Um, so we continue to pursue that. So back to the bioheat, we've got a project that's costing $1.7 million, 90% funded by the three sources and the district kicks in 10%, 176,000 of the $1.7 million project, which will bring bioheat to Sycamus. It's to be located in the Sycamus Industrial Park. Um, our first hookup, our first tenant that we're looking at is committed and that is a user of wood and propane and that's TA Structures, the manufacturing plant that sits in the Sycamus Industrial Park. They've agreed to be our first tenant and where they would hook up to this bioheat facility, which is basically taking fuel from the forest floor, which presents a threat and converting it into heat. With that, we also have money to expand the system. So our hope is not only do we want to cover the industrial park and all the future uh, load and convert them to uh, this, this uh, biomass facility, we also are looking at expanding the downhill your road where there is not only proposed, but existing new development on the residential side, because right now everybody in Sycamus pays a carbon tax. You pay it when you go to the fuel tanks, you pay it when you purchase oil, propane, you pay a carbon tax in BC, it's $50 a ton. And it's gonna go up to $175 a ton as per the NDP plan over the next eight years to deter people from using fossil fuels. So what we've done is we've taken this bold step, council's taken this bold step to bring biomass to Sycamus and located in the industrial park, offer an incentive to businesses who no longer would have to pay that carbon tax, who can burn their wood clean and provide heat to their facilities. So we welcome any future uh, industrial properties and other residential properties to come talk to us as we move forward. So. <laughs> Um, what we're trying to do now is put together a contract and council has directed staff to bring that contract to the next regularly scheduled meeting of November the 10th, uh, a week after our town hall. And that contract would be for phase one, which would be essentially the boiler, the house, the mechanical and the hookup. So we can kickstart this program. The operating side, uh, we're hoping that um, when we, we derive all the revenues, we have an experienced operator who's going to operate it, and that's Fink Machines based out of Enderby. But we're hoping the operating dollars and the net profit that we take from this facility be redirected into municipal programs as council sees fit. They can direct those funds to any area. Maybe it goes back to the environment, most notably it will, to make it even better and attractive to bring business and green business to Sycamus. So at the end of the day, Mr. Mayor and Council, this is all about reducing our carbon footprint, which the federal and local governments look upon uh, local governments to, to bring down those levels. And so the feds and the province are on board and um, commend Council for this initiative. Thank you. All right, just to add to that, uh, this entire project uh, is primarily funded through grant funding. And uh, so I think it's gonna be well received. All right, any other comments on this? All right, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I think there is one other thing. Deb, are you willing to, uh, uh, we have 17 here and on our priorities, uh, the community's in blue. Do you want to comment now or do you want to wait until after? I, uh... I can say it now quick and then- Go ahead, I'm yes. Yep. Yeah. So I'm giving I'm... you the floor. You got it. I did send out the message to everybody. Of course, the wind up for the communities, provincial communities in blue awards <laughs> is tomorrow and it's virtual. And so the Legion has agreed to set up they're big screens so that anybody that would like to attend 7 p.m. tomorrow and uh, check out the awards. I cannot tell you what form the awards will take this year because uh, basically there was no judging. It was basically we made a submission and they received it. And so it's, it, it's a little bit casual. It's a little bit ad hoc this year. But I think, you know, it's, it, it'll be good if, if people can come out and check it out. It, uh, 
you know, to see, see what they have to say in terms of giving us feedback about our submission. All right, thanks, Doug. Good luck, I'll be there. All right, anything? Any comments or questions on communities in bloom? Okay. Nothing else on strategic priorities? Then we're going to move on. All right, uh, councillors' reports. Uh, I'm going to start with Councillor Aries today. Oh. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, there's nothing new to report during these last couple of weeks. Um, residents are a lot more interested in a lot of projects around town, so there's been a lot of, a lot of conversations. Uh, which are interesting, but I don't have any any new information to share about anything. But thanks uh, to everyone who's who's talked to me about their about their opinions. I always appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Aries, Councillor Malmus. Um, well, let's see. The rail trail meeting was a week ago, previous Friday. Um, they got funding to do a section of rail trail from Sycamus to the old town Mara. And we contributed 232,000 to it through the EOF fund via Sycamus and area E. So looking forward to seeing, and that's supposed, it, it has to be used to make the trail usable. It's not gonna be, uh, not going to be a, a real great finish on it, but it will be useful and walkable. Not, this, I think they're just going to compact the rock on it or whatever, but it's not to put a top dressing or any of that on there, as far as I understand. So, be interesting to see how the the, the rail trail fills out over next year because it's supposed to be done by spring of 2021, isn't it? So, it'd be nice to be able to walk down it. Um, also, uh, during that, the mayor and I made a trip to, uh, meet with Mr. Kevin Acker of Lumbee, but also the chair of the RDNO to have a discussion with him regarding the rail trail. That was, uh, a week ago. Um, and I'd, I'd like to just make a comment on, there's, there's a lot of rumors going around town and, and these rumors start, I don't know, on this rant and rave or, well, I'm not sure where they start, but they, they end up falling on my doorstep because as my colleague just stated that people call and comment and that's good. So that's how I find out things because I'm not on rant and rave or any of that social media stuff, Facebook. Uh, so the, I made a call today. The, the thing is, is that people are going, well, we think the same guy bought the, bought the property at 530 Main Street, which is the Mount Park Sport Building. And, and that guy just bought the Paradise Hotel too. Um, I can't confirm if that's true or untrue. Uh, then their next comment is, well, he's closed the Paradise Hotel. That's untrue. The Paradise Hotel has got a no vacancy sign on it because the new owners take possession on November the 15th and they're trying to get the property cleaned up with their belongings that they're removing from it. So that's the reason that it's closed. So, you know, if people want to comment about stuff, maybe they could phone and find out for themselves what the actual facts are. That would be greatly appreciated rather than rant and rave and what other, other media they're doing this on. So I got better things to do with my personal time than chase around to answer questions about stuff that they could make a phone call on and get the actual facts. Thanks, Councillor Malmas. Councillor Evans. Yeah, um, I would say the days are uh, packed with a lot of questions. I had to start drinking peppermint tea because I was drinking too much coffee. And, people. <laughs> um, and I was getting the jitters from too much caffeine. So um, I've had a fair amount of one-on-ones uh, -on with folks in town that have a lot of questions. And, Happy to do that. I, I echo uh, Mr. Parliament's invitation to please come to the town halls next week. And I also echo Councillor Mollis's request to please call if you have a question instead of spreading things out there that just aren't true. Um, I think it's very important that you give the benefit of the doubt in the community that's as small as ours and, and uh, ask good questions. The answers are readily available. Um, in addition to those meetings, one-on-one -on -one with people, I've been uh, going to meetings with uh, early 
the early years committee, uh, trying to improve services to our, our children, meeting with the principal at the high school, and uh, yeah, nice busy. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Councilor Bushel. Through the chair, yeah, I don't have a lot. Uh, I guess I've been uh, pretty busy answering the phone as well, I guess, Just taking lots of calls uh, with what's going on in town. And uh, yeah, that's been keeping me busy, uh, spending lots of time back with the Snowmobile Club. I have a little presentation to do later on in regards to Owlhead and the, and the forest, forest fire we had up there this summer. And um, yeah, uh, going through the zoning, the, the um, Scott's team has been uh, working real hard to get the uh, zoning bylaw done and uh, we had a committee meeting today that went really well um yeah and uh, daryl's uh, doing a real good job on the beach park there that's coming along really well thanks daryl thanks okay councilor push of councilor anderson um ditto 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 um <laughs> i've been getting a lot of calls too i've been working on some tech stuff too we have the uh, uh, lead on a, a business that wants uh, maybe interested in coming to say i have been working with her um, I too agree. If you've got questions, call us rather than um, be, be an armchair coach sitting behind your computer screen. So it's, um, yeah, it's really important that uh, the correct information is is sent through town so to the community. So yeah, if you do have questions, call us or uh, call the district and uh, let's, let's um, yeah, get all the correct information. Thanks, Councilor Anderson. Councilor McCabe. Uh, good evening. I, I might as well ask the same thing. I, I don't post a lot on uh, social media, but <clears throat> I, I do read it to try and see you uh, keep a pulse in the community, if you will. But please, if you want to post something, make sure it's accurate. And, and if you're not sure, uh, if it's involving development, we have a city planner, you can phone the front desk and ask. But to spread false rumors doesn't help our community at all. Um, yeah, I was at a planning meeting this morning, and uh, that was interesting. Uh, got a lot of things going on. We weren't getting a lot of questions. That means we won't. We we aren't doing anything, but we are getting a lot of questions. So that means we're getting something something done. Just on Main Street itself, we've got um, two different housing projects, um, a healing center. Um, that's that's. Uh, three different in uh, Mountain Park Motorsports or a developer wanting to do something there. So there's four different projects on Main Street in the course of, you know, 500 meters that are all multi-million dollar projects. So things are moving in Sycamusa. We'll start keeping our small town atmosphere, but uh, moving forward with development. Um, Council Burso and myself are meeting Friday with Splatson to dis discuss things of, of mutual interest to both our communities. Mm, that's about it. Um, oh, and I'm late for my curling game. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Councillor McCabe. All right, there's a few things that I, I've uh, been involved with, and apart from answering lots of phone calls as well, and um, hoping hopefully you can answer most of the community's concerns on November the third. Um, the importance of a housing needs assessment uh, uh, has been forward to council tonight. Um, we are starting our budgetary process here uh, shortly. Uh, uh, Kelly's got the dates all lined up for us. Um, community's in bloom tomorrow night, and I'm sure that uh, Bev, uh, or she, uh, she's going to, or Deb will definitely uh, probably be recognized once again for her hard work in our community. Did a fantastic job in a very tough year. Um, something that was really important and um, I spent uh, along with uh, Jen and Kelly about an hour and a half or more with uh, Mel Arnold and his assistant and uh, talking about uh, the uh, grant funding that uh, is available to us and the different projects that uh, we're in the middle of that need assistance when it comes to uh, grant funding. And so uh, the concentration will be on Main Street and probably the pedestrian bridge and uh, and uh, the amount of support that we can get from uh, Mel Arnold as our MP uh, when it comes to getting some sort of financial assistance uh, as to anything that comes up in the future uh, when it comes to uh, uh, federal grant money. Uh, 
uh, a interesting visit to Caslo, and uh, this is something that we're working on, um, and that is fiber optics for the entire community. Uh, I also had a conversation with Mel Arnold as to where we could go with that when it comes to grant funding. So we're working on that. Um, uh, we are uh, going to have uh, Bill Miller from Habitat on uh, November the 3rd as a guest uh, to answer any questions in regards to that development. And also uh, the architect that's uh, designing the wellness center, uh, Doug Cardinal, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Veen will be there as to that particular conceptual uh, project. And I think once you see some of these projects and the and the conceptual designs, I hope that's going to change some of your thinking as to where we're going to go with the community in the future. Um, the planning committee, I uh, joined that today as well, and um, and. Um, there's a lot going on and thanks to Scott and his crew trying to get through some of this stuff uh, as uh, as we uh, as we enter into some of these developments and and thanks to the, the chair councilor Malmus as well for uh, leading that. Um, so I think that's pretty much for me that got a lot more going on but uh, once again I certainly wish that anybody that has concerns, please join us in that November 3rd town hall meeting at the senior center. All right, um, with that being said, that's my report. Okay, is there anything now for Councillor Rise report from the Committee of the Whole? Not really, eh? Um, nope, just a motion to rise and report. This okay, so just a motion to rise and report uh, from the Committee. Uh, Councillor Evans, Councillor Aries, all in favor, carried, we'll move on. Now we have five minutes that's allotted to uh, anybody that may have their hand up um, on, uh, on our screen right now uh, before I ask somebody from the gallery. So is there any hands up that we have? That... We do, we've got a Janet who has her hand up. All right. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I see a lot of people complaining about uh, um, council not being uh, very forthwith uh, about planning, about uh, letting people know what's going on ahead of time. And uh, you, as you just said, you know, I think when people see this, they'll be very happy with it. Well, you know, it's, it's been planned, you've got plans and, and, and people haven't seen it yet. I, I think they have a valid uh, 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 problem then. I think that the community should be, uh, you know, you should be more um, open with the community and, and, and people about what you're doing instead of uh, telling people after the fact. All right, thank you for that. Yeah, I was gonna say something last week. But I keep on hearing that people in this town don't know what's going on. There's council meetings here every second and fourth Wednesday. And if you care to get off your dime and tune in or participate in person, then you'll get all the information you need to know on what's going on in this town. And I'd like to thank this council for doing just an excellent job on moving this community forward. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. You have another hand up? Uh, no hand up, sorry. No more hands up? No. <clears throat> uh, any other comments from the gallery? All right, I'm hearing none. Janet has raised her hand again. Um, okay, yeah, go ahead. I'll give you the opportunity one more time. Have go you ahead. got, have you got um, plans that 
that uh, the uh, people can access of the wellness center? November 3rd. Short answer is no. What we have, no, I, I can answer that. Thank you. Yeah, Devin. It's, it's Evan Parliament. <clears throat> what we have is um, a contract to enter into a design, a potential design. Nothing's been designed, but we have a fair idea of the type of services we're going to offer in the healing center, and that will all be shared on November 3rd. Uh, so you know, but you're not going to share it. Uh, up until November third. Oh. No, I don't. I don't have a design. There is no design. The question is: Is there a design for the healing center? The answer is no. We've got a consultant looking at a design. It hasn't been approved yet. Has, we haven't even seen it. So no, I'm not holding anything back. What I will present on November third is what the healing center, in terms of the services and programs, are going to offer. But the look and feel of the building, we ha it hasn't been designed yet. In oh, okay. Fact, in fact, there'll be a local. Um, group to assist in the design and feel of this building. We're actually going to involve some members of the public who would like an interest in that. Um, but how that building looks like, none of us know because we just entered into a contract with the architect oh. just a month ago. Okay. Um, any chance of getting a, a, a look at the list of services you have in mind? Sure. I, I can bring that all on November the 3rd. The existing services of the Community Health Center, the Sycamus Community Health Center, you know, we have two and a half doctors. And if you're familiar with that clinic when Dr. Beach ran it, and if you're familiar with the clinic now, we provide all kinds of services. And we also, that building uh, houses other businesses, but the new uh, health center is going to have additional services that we're looking at and working with Interior Health, uh, working with uh, other stakeholders in allied healthcare, uh, counseling services, et cetera. And that'll all be shared on November 3rd. Councilor Malmas, go ahead. I think that one of the issues that happened was, and I have no idea how it got out, but at the Planning and Development Committee meeting, when they were talking about 200 Main, there was a drawing that was put forward that had a big blue building on it and some parking area and a green space. How that got into the public hands, I have no idea. At the Planning and Development Committee meeting, it was discussed that one of the major things that was the requirement in the district of Sycamus was some parking. So please don't build or design a building on a lot that has no parking. But the building will look like what the final parking lot will look like, what the green space that's gonna be left over will look like has not been decided at all by anybody. It's going to be presented at some point, I can't tell you the date, by an architect who's actually world renowned for some of his designs and we've seen some of his designs. And when you listen to Dr. Avino and you listen to uh, the architect, I think you'll go away from that meeting impressed because I was skeptical and after they made their presentation here of what they're going to do because they listened to everybody. They, they listened to us. Now they're gonna to come to this open house and listen to the community. They've gone to First Nations to Splatson and listen to them. And so they're going to design a building that is probably going to be spectacular, will be an asset to the community. But what it looks like, we have no idea. It's not there yet. I, can I add one more thing? As, as a medical professional, one thing that is, is badly, badly, sorely needed in this town is... Uh, a lab. We, it's it's absolutely pathetic that you that you've got a few hours one day a week for for lab work. Uh, I mean, that's terrible. People that are on blood thinners. I I did house calls doing blood tests for years, and people that are on uh, blood thinners or, I mean, that's terrible. That's shameful. You you de you desperately need a lab here. Anyway. Thanks, Janet. Uh, thanks, thanks, Janet. We have two more hands that are up here, so I'm gonna yeah. I'm yeah. gonna ask. Well, thanks for your comments, and I'm gonna mm -hmm. just ask for the uh, uh, who's the next one up there now? The Dar uh, Darlene Green. Hmm? Darlene Green is next. Darlene Green, Darlene, are you up? Can you hear us? 
I think she took her hand down. No, her hand's up. Hello. Oh, there she is. Hello. Can you go hear ahead? Me? Go ahead, darling. Uh, through the chair to the doctor that was just asking if, if you request a copy from the district of the grant application, you will see the vision that they have, and they have not changed at this time to what the healing center is going to be. Um, as to your comments for the lab service here in town, 100% totally agree. And I could also add uh, five or six other services that are required here in this town for medical services that have not even been even touched in any of these applications or proposals. And I'm sure as a doctor, you will realize when you are dealing with people that are ill and you have to be somewhere quick, being in Sycamuse in the winter and trying to travel to Vernon or Salmon Arm to a hospital in a snow blizzard or a road closure is not an option. Thank you, Darlene. All right, uh, uh, we have another hand up. Uh, and we're just about running out of time. So Thank who is you. that? Eileen has a hand. Eileen, uh, you're up. Hey, Can guys, you hear us? Hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I do have a question on this proposed healing center, and that's around the cost estimate. When is the last time the council undertook a cost estimate? And, uh, and if you have done one recently, can you share that out to us? can't understand you. We, we're having trouble hearing you. Yeah. Yeah. Eileen, do you want to try typing your question into the chat and I could read it out? Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. better. Go ahead. Um, my question was, when is the last time the council undertook a cost estimate for this proposed healing center? And don't you think it would be warranted to update it given the escalation we've seen due to COVID? Evan, you want to comment? Well, thank you. Uh, very good question. That's because of the supply chain issues facing the, the entire globe and COVID and the escalation of, you know, six months ago, the price of lumber. Um, you'll notice that outside our electronic sign was out of commission for up to eight months. And it was over a small part that we couldn't obtain because of the supply chain issue. So yes, this is a question we asked the team and the team will be there on November 3rd. And this is the contractor who's gonna build this facility about the, the costs. The bottom line is it's up to the contractor and that's Scott Builders to provide a budget and make sure the architect and the needs of the community and the healthcare needs all fit within this $6 million unconditional federal provincial grant. We can't go over above that. If we go over $6 million, we either have to trim it back, reduce the size of the footprint of the building or seek additional funding from other sources. Because right now, council has directed staff to proceed with this brand new community health center at a cap budget of $6 million. So all these challenges with the escalation of costs are gonna be monitored and managed by our contractor, Scott Builders, in conversation with all the stakeholders. We have to fit it within the $6 million budget. Okay, but we do recognize that you can't build anything today for $6 million, right? Like that, you don't need a cost estimate update to know that. Well, so, one of those, what, one of the questions we asked is, what does $6 million build you? And so if you go to the town of Nanton, which is south of Calgary, which is the most recent community health center that Scott Builders was uh, involved in, you can see exactly what $6 million builds. It, it, it can be done, okay? Our challenge is to make this building aesthetically pleasing and warm and welcoming within that budget. So the answer is yes, you can build anything for 6 million. In fact, there is a specific building and I can bring that to November 3rd on exactly what the town of Nanton built in their community health center for $6 million. Okay, but I'd be curious to see how long ago they built it, um, but I'm looking forward to it. And on this point of the town hall, typically town halls are um, things that have formal agendas, and they have um, uh, formal speakers. And how are you planning on running a Zoom on a drop-in three to five? I don't 
I'm not sure I understand the methodology. Great question. It's very tough. Um, we, we have to follow the protocols of the PHO, the provincial health officer, and we have to limit it to 50 people. No, our, I understand our, that. Yeah, our, I, our I, goal, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I understand that. But then why don't you go to a complete formal town hall, put out a formal yeah. agenda, put on formal speakers, and run it formally versus saying, I have no idea. It's a week away. You should have yeah. an idea. Yeah, no, like I said earlier uh, today, when I was asked by a fellow counselor, we can have a second meeting. The, the first meeting, November 3rd, is interactive. We're going to have six different stations where you can come in, you can walk around, gather information. We're also going to have a Q&A opportunity, both from those that are in attendance and those that are attending via Zoom. In terms of a more formal format where you have theater seating and you have a stage and a microphone, uh, maybe that's the second meeting we can have. But we're going to try to address all the information we can uh, on November 3rd. And that's why we've set up this very informal, interactive six stations to deal with these six different projects we identified earlier. And if it means having a second one more formal, we can certainly look at that. Okay. So then okay. what type of approval are you seeking to gain from the public? My, I think the overall question is this. You're talking about we're proposing but you've already entered into a $250,000 contract with consultants to do what? And at what point are you going to bring it back to the people of Sycamore to formally get sanction on this? I don't think the council has a carte blanche to just go ahead with building something in a green space without some type of uh, referendum within the, the district to talk about that. Yep. Well, council has uh, the right to go ahead on any project that doesn't either A, provide uh, and, and require electoral consent. They're elected to make decisions. When the public's engaged, it's when an electoral consent um, process is initiated, whether it's an alternative approval process or a referendum. Anytime council borrows money that needs to be financed more than five years requires electoral consent. So legally, our councils are voted across British Columbia every four years to make decisions. And anything that requires public consent, the formal approval of the public falls under either park disposition, borrowing of funds, and a few others. Anything outside of that, council is charged to make decisions. In the case of 200 Main, it's tricky. It's a commercial lot with green space. We recognize that. It's got green grass and it's got trees. Um, it's not a part of the park disposition process. And so what we're trying to do is unveil all these plans to the public and get input back from the public. But there is no legal requirement to have the public sign off on these things. That is why council's taken the bold move, no different than when they purchased Finlayson Place back in 2017. They financed it internally. It didn't require electoral consent. So we bought the clinic. In 2020, we purchased- But now you're not even going to utilize the clinic for what you bought it for. This is the whole point. Pardon right? me? Pardon me? You're not Eileen? even going to- Eileen, I'm sorry. Uh, we're running out of time. We've got a delegation coming on. I appreciate your questions. And, uh, and if you wish, uh, just uh, send us uh, more of your questions into our corporate officer, Jen Bruins and uh, or or Evan and uh, we'll try to answer them, but we have to carry yeah, on. I, I apologize, you were cut off there, Eileen. I know there's an agenda. Yeah, go ahead. Please give me a call tomorrow. We can continue this conversation. I have no problem continuing this conversation. Apologies. Thank you, Eileen. All right. Uh, so now we uh, we uh, have a delegation, and it's uh, Christine De Glos. Christina. Close 200 Main Street. Uh, is she on uh, Zoom right now? I'm here. Okay. Yep. Can yeah, everybody hear me? Hi. You're yeah. Talking. I think I think Eileen's question was that the building on Main Street or on uh, Finlayson that you guys had recently purchased isn't going to be used for what you had purchased it for before she was just cut off there. I think that's what she was trying to say. So um, if you'd like to make any further comments on that, please go ahead. I understand we have a delegation. Uh, right now, and we've got about 15 minutes. So if you'd like to answer Eileen's question um, regarding the Finlayson uh, purchase, please go ahead. Go ahead, Evan. The, the 217 Finlayson purchase? The That's medical right, yeah. yeah. And the question is, 
we already purchased it. Yes, and it's not being used for what you had purchased it for because the clinic is now being moved to the healing center. Well, the, cl the clinic, um, the actual building, so let's talk about the building. So the building is an 11,000 square foot facility at 217 Finlayson. It was privately held and the district purchased it in 2017. Inside the building, 25% is the medical clinic. The other 75% is private sector. There's a dental office in there, private, but nothing to do with the district's community health center. It's a private enterprise. There's a private business upstairs. The rest of the space in the building is community space. It is the intent of council to transfer the existing allied healthcare, anything to do with healthcare, most notably our own community health center, the 25% footprint into the new community health center to be located on Main Street. The, the purpose of the existing building can either be sold, it could be dedicated community space, it could be turned over to the development corporation to pursue um, economic development opportunities. It's an asset owned by the, uh, the, the taxpayers, that entire building. But I, I think I should clarify that inside the building, only 25% of the total square footage is dedicated to the what we have now, which is our community health center, the medical clinic. Okay, um, we'll just, we're just gonna move on because we're here for a, for a different reason, sort of. Um, I'm sorry, can someone please tell me what is the correct, correct pronunciation of the mayor's name? Just, just so that I don't get it wrong um, during this discussion. Sorry, I can't. Oh, it's, it's Terry, Terry Rice. Just Terry like Rice, that. thank you so Terry much. Rice. Thanks so much for that. Um, and I have another question uh, before we begin. Um, at the last council meeting, um, one of the council members brought up the fact that 200 Main Street is not zoned as a park. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but the nice piece of land that, didn't, that the new bathroom at the beach is sitting on is also not zoned as a park. Am I right about that? You mean the beach park? So That's right. So it, no, it's designated what, a park. From it's what I was, a park. Okay, so there is a part like the like the sand part, and then up to the sidewalk from the map that I was looking at, it looks like that part of the beach is a park, but it looks like that big grassy area with the bathrooms and all of that yeah. Yeah. is not designated as a park. Am I wrong about that? Yes, it's designated a park. It is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. I I believe there's a document on your website that says that it's owned by the district, but not designated as a park because the map that I was looking at had a bunch of green space on it and everything that was designated as a park was green and so on and so forth. So the map might be incorrect. Um, if you guys want to have a look at that, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. Just to clarify, park is designated through bylaw and we have a park regulations bylaw and that is what lists all of our parks. Right. I have to forward that to you. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to get to the, the delegation, um, I'd like to open, I know there's quite a few people in the gallery tonight and we're all interested in the same thing. We're interested in the development of 200 Main Street. Uh, I'd like to open with a brief history of the community of Sycamus's relationship with 200 Main Street. So just a very brief history of our relationship with 200 Main Street. 200 Main Street was purchased, as I understand, in 2015 by Sycamus taxpayers as a community asset and possible future park. Does anyone remember who said this? Anyone? Okay, I'll tell you. It was said by Sycamus Mayor Terry Rice in an Eagle Valley News article dated September 17, 2021. So it was purchased as a community asset and possible future park. 200 Main Street is recognized by the District of Sycamus as a park, and we know this because it's advertised on the District of Sycamus's very own website as a park. You guys advertise it as a park. 200 Main Street has been recognized by the community of Sycamus as a park. It has been the chosen site for countless community functions, car shows, concerts, beer gardens, and even, guess what, movie night in the park. 200 Main Street has been recognized by Sycamus Town Council as a park. Council passed a first reading August 11th, 2021, as I understand it, to amend the zoning bylaw from C1 commercial to P3 park. It was bought as a park, advertised as a park, used as a park, 
and as recently as 12 weeks ago, passed the first re le reading of legally becoming a park. For these reasons, we shall call it what it is, a Sycamus Town Centre Park. As a group of concerned citizens, our focus has been singular since learning of the council's decision to move the Shushwap Healing Center from the 400 block across from Askew's to the town center park at the end of Main Street. After several emails and freedom of information requests, I thought I might share a couple of the responses we got from the district that we thought really illuminated their lack of transparency regarding this development. I'll read directly from the email at this point. Our request number one was this. The district has failed to conduct a community impact study regarding the loss of the Sycamus Town Centre Park. If a study of this nature has been conducted, please provide evidence of this. The district responded. This was their response. A parks, recreation and open space plan was completed in March of 2011. Section 3.7 of this plan specifically examines the overall park supply and level of service. That was the district's response. So, okay, since we're now going into 2022, how does a parks, recreation and open space plan from 2011 count as a community impact study for the loss of a park that has been used as a park since 2015? This document from 2011 is not a viable community impact study. And quite frankly, I'm embarrassed for the district that they would try to pass it off as one. Our second request was this. The initial grant application states, and I quote, there have been several stakeholder workshops. Would someone mind their phone, please? I'll start over. Our second request was this. The initial grant application states, and I quote, there have been several stakeholder workshops, community consultation exercises, and consultants reports that address all of the interested groups that subscribe to community wellness and overall healthy built environments. But oddly enough, the residents of Sycamus cannot recall a time when we were consulted on the proposed development of the Sycamus Town Center Park. We ask the district to please provide the documentation for the tremendous support for the proposed facility referenced in the initial grant application. The district responded with one sentence. This request will be processed as a request for records with a file reference number of 05802053. That was their response. To reiterate, we were asking for documentation that supported the district's claim that they had held several stakeholder workshops and community consultation exercises and that they had, quote, tremendous community support for the proposed facility. The truth is, the District of Sycamus has had consultations. They have consulted with the Splats and Development Corporation, Alberta-based architect Douglas Cardinal, Arizona-based health consultant Dr. Tafoya, Victoria-based design team Christine Lintot Architects, and Alberta-based Scott Builders. They have also consulted with Eagle Valley Community Support Society, Eagle Valley Senior, Seniors Housing Society, Eagle Valley Transportation Society, the Sycamus Chamber of Commerce, the District of Sycamus Community Wellness Committee, and the District of Sycamus Development Corporation, but they have not, I repeat, not consulted with the taxpaying residents of Sycamus at all during their research phase of this development. There has been zero public consultation zero public input period, zero town hall meetings, zero surveys, and zero invites to any of the meetings held behind closed doors with any of the corporations and societies I just listed. Simply put, we were not invited to speak. The only reason we were awarded a last minute town hall, if one can call it that, was because we showed up at the October 13th council meeting and demanded one. We want to be completely clear with the mayor, the councillors, and the staff of the District of Sycamus. We, the residents, are not okay with this park being developed in any capacity for any reason. It does not matter how fancy the building is or how famous the architect. 
Once this park, this park is developed, it's gone forever. I'll remind the district, it is also not the resident's job to find a suitable alternative for the location of the, of the proposed development. That is the job of the district of Sycamus. We are here at this meeting as taxpaying residents to let you know that although we support a new medical facility in Sycamus, we will use every resource at our disposal, whether it be contacting other levels of government, the Ombudsman's office in Victoria, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, or our friends at Global News. We will continue to do everything in our power to prevent this park from being developed. I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you for your time. All right, thanks, Christine, for that. <clears throat> so we're at the end of the delegation. And it's time for us to move into the rest of the meeting. All right, so uh, the next uh, is 11 staff reports regarding development permit application number 21211 DP, that's 530 Main Street. Scott, can you give us a report? I can, thank you, Chair. I'm just waiting for the ability to share my screen. <clears throat> well, Kelly's working on it. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so we received an application for a uh, development permit at uh, 530 Main Street. Um, I believe Mark, the um, a consultant, uh, Sean, a traffic engineer, and Sweet Paul, the owner, are all online. If council has any questions, um, we'll be available to answer those questions. And I should be sharing now. So here's the, the property, 530 Main Street. Um, as you can see, there's 530 and 534 Main Street. So um, this application is for 530 Main Street. So it's everything around 534. 534 is the building, the existing, um, what was once the Mountain Park Motorsports building. And the application is to consider a gas bar, uh, paving, waste storage, land and landscaping. Um, the reason um, we're not considering the building and the form and character of the, the existing building or proposed changes to that building is um, at this time, um, council can't approve a development permit for that, that building, for that property, because it's in the, um, it's part of the uh, contaminant site disclosure process. So they're working through their process. In the meantime, they'd like to get started on developing the property. Um, <coughs> the, uh, for the, the amenities around the, the building. And um, yeah, the when the development permit comes forward for the building, they'll be looking at you know the form and character of the existing building. So the changes they'd be making to the outside of the building. Um, property is designated, um, see if we can move on, uh, Gateway Town Center in the official community plan. So in the gate, Gateway Town Center, then uh, the there's uh, requirements for guidelines for form and character. And um, they address landscaping, outdoor seating and artwork and sidewalks. Um, and then they'd also address the, the form and character of a building. But right now, the, the where council's not considering the building, uh, or this permit doesn't address that. And then the zoning of the property right now is C1 Town Center Commercial. Um, the proposed uses include retail sales, food and beverage service, service and repair. Um, so that would cover the, the gas station, the restaurants, and then a convenience store. Those are all permitted uses in the, the, the zoning bylaw as it is. We have uh, drawing that's showing the, the site plan. You can see the, the existing building in the middle. Um, you'd come in off the, the uh, roundabout and you enter the, the building or the, the property um, just in the corner here, the uh, southeast corner, and you'd enter the property, uh, you come around, um, you can enter one drive through. Um, here we have the, the garbage containers, which will be finished in a, a contemporary style. Um, underground tanks, they're proposing some artwork and a fountain in this area, uh, parking, 
Um, one of the few feature phases could include a, uh, a hotel and then uh, the gas bar right here. And then you'd exit coming through the property um, and back onto Main Street, kind of right where you entered. Um, and then they're also proposing landscaping along the, the boulevard. Um, one question that came up about the Planning and Development Committee previously was, um, what, what do the turning radiuses look like for different types of vehicles entering the property? Um, so they have the, the different size campers and motorhomes, and um, all of them are able to negotiate that turn. Um, here's one, it's a Super B fuel truck. The median they're, they're building would be, I guess it's called a, a mountable median. Um, and so the, the fuel truck would be one of those um, truck says two trailers would would need to mount that median to turn, but it appears that all the other vehicles would be able to, to enter the property. Um, and then the development permit conditions. So um, right now the conditions they address the outdoor lighting, garbage and recycling enclosure, outdoor amenities, including a uh, fountain and seating, and then proposed artwork. And the uh, landscaping plan. So they have a plan that's uh, prepared by Outland Design Architecture. Um, they're looking at boulevard trees and other things just on the other corner. Um, so as you come off the, the Trans Canada Highway, you can see where um, yeah, the, the plantings are proposed. Um, they'd be um, guaranteed for two years um, and maintained for two years. And uh, the district would collect a 110% security. So if they, if they aren't maintained, the district would be able to maintain them. And then there, because some of these plantings occur um, in the boulevard, which is, uh, which is off the property, then uh, a servicing agreement would be required. And then traffic, there's been um, some questions about uh, traffic. So a traffic study was completed. Um, Sean Benbo, the traffic engineer is, uh, is on the line. If uh, council has any questions, um, yeah, he, he did model the, uh, the intersection um, with uh, the development and Main Street. He also did traffic counting on the, he used uh, numbers from the Ministry of Transportation on the highway, and then uh, also did a traffic count on the, the traffic circle. And um, he said the, the wait times would, uh, they did, do not expect queuing on Main Street or on the, the roundabout. And the, the service is very good. And that's even with 100% um, increase. So if you doubled the uh, the, um, the time they did the traffic count, then they'd, it would still be a, a very good um, service for uh, for the traffic. Um, we did send this out for consultation. Um, we referred it internally, um, also to Ministry of Transportation um, and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I guess the the first question uh, might be why why wasn't it why didn't we refer it out? Um, by mail, like a development variance permit or a zoning bylaw, where if a property is identified for a change, you, you refer it out to all the property owners within uh, 50 meters. In this case, the, because it meets the conditions of the official community plan, then you know you make the assumption everybody who has had an opportunity to contribute to the uh, official community plan, and then they would, if everybody's agreed to the guidelines and the conditions that you'd, you'd have to go through to get the permit, so that's why there isn't the need or the, the statutory requirement for community consultation. But we do refer it out um, to um, the, uh, the different agencies. Um, and yeah, we had no objections from the building inspection bylaw, bylaw officer, engineering technologist um, recommended a desktop tra traffic analysis and that was completed. Um, some I, uh, and then some of the improvements were identified in that right of way. Um, the fire chief noted that hydrants are required to protect new and future development, Ministry of Transportation, um, highway approvals are not required. They, their responsibility kind of stops at um, Trans Canada and Highway 97A, so they didn't have any comments. Um, we didn't have a recommendation from the Planning and Development Committee. Um, the committee did see it uh, a couple times. Um, did work with the owner a little bit on uh, some of the requirements. Um, and um, the Planning Development C Committee did say that they would like to meet the owner on site and then talk about some of the, the issues that they see. Uh, was referred to the Chamber of Commerce. We did receive a letter back from the Chamber of Commerce, um, and they basically identified uh, that the, uh, they don't. They felt that the uh, development doesn't meet the official community plan. They had concerns about the traffic. Then concerns about franchise businesses and drive-throughs and we received six letters from 
um, other members of the community that uh, pretty much echoed those concerns with the OCP traffic and franchise businesses. Um, and I think at the end of my slides, um, staff has worked with the owner. The owner's been uh, very, very easy to work with. He's willing to work with the community and, and um, do whatever it takes to, to get uh, what the community wants to see, um, offering that, that artwork and the, the fountain and uh, outdoor seating, enhanced landscaping on the boulevard. Um, it meets the OCP and the, the zoning bylaw. Um, they did the traffic study. Um, the servicing agreements are available to address some of those concerns. Um, one area we can uh, address the traffic through that um, service agreement is if improvements are necessary in the future, then the, the owner would, uh, would contribute to those improvements. Um, staff has recommended that uh, this be approved. Um, the, the Planning Development Committee would like to, to have that opportunity to meet with the consultant on site, and that makes a lot of sense. So I'll leave it for, uh, for council. If you have any questions, I'm here. And then um, there's also some people online that uh, can answer the questions as well. Mr. Lomas. <laughs> Thank you to the chair. Um, so yes, uh, this is addressed to the developer, the, the proponent. Um, the planning and, and development committee today, we brought it forward again. A lot of questions by the general public. And so be, before we vote on this, um, I'd like to actually table it and see if there's a way that uh, uh, the proponent and Mark and the, uh, maybe the traffic engineer, but not necessarily, if we could meet on site sometime and bring this back to the next council meeting so that we can come up with a comfort level that can be portrayed to the public so that this isn't such a, what's the word I'm looking for? Help me. Contentious. <laughs> yeah, contentious issue. So um, if that's acceptable to the proponent, then I would like to table it and have staff make arrangements with you for a meeting at your very earliest convenience. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead, Councillor McKay. Yeah, I had, thank you through the chair, one question to the developer. Um, so the application is for 530 and um, for a gas bar to start construction of all your infrastructure. <clears throat> you can't deal with 534 because of, uh, what's it, environmental, uh, help me out with the wording there, Scott. So it's part of the, uh, it's like for the um, contaminated site disclosure. Right, contaminated site disclosure. So we can't even vote on that because as a council, we can't. Uh, do anything with a contaminated site. So uh, my question is, if we pass this in its existing form, uh, how, do, how does the gas bar do business? How does money change hands? Where, how, does, how do people get gas when there's no building to go pay for the gas? Right. Thank you through the chair. Um, so the idea is to develop the property, like, you know, the gas bar would not be open until the in store is available. Um, so right now they want to get started on some of the, the site prep work and they can't do that until this development permit's issued. The next step would be a development permit for the, the, the building and the convenience store. And the intention would be that uh, as soon as the, the site disclosure releases the property, then, um, then they'd be ready to go on the, the, the form and character and the, the renovations to the, the existing building. So there could be a potential gap there where the gas bar is ready, but there's no, no building to accommodate it because they're still in their contaminated site procedure. Through the chair. There's no guaranteed continuity. I, I think there are, there are no guarantees, but um, yeah, I think their plan is to, is to have the, the gas bar and the convenience store open at the same time. I've dealt with some environmental impacts before in contaminated sites, so that's not, not a guaranteed process of a uh, guaranteed timeline. But any, any, my question was to the developer actually. Oh, sorry. All right. Well, should we ask Mark to speak to that? I can take it sweet while here. Uh, you guys can hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so 
uh, good question. Uh, so this is only looking for the development part. Uh, the other structures, which will be above ground, all the permits are going to be separate. Uh, right now, we are looking at bringing in the services, uh, putting in the tanks below ground, and all. All the above structure will be done in accordance when we get the development permit for the 534. And so there won't be uh, any structures coming on 530 till we finish that. It's just meanwhile, um, we are going through all the processes. We were looking to uh, finish uh, the servicing part of uh, 530. I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Mr. Malmas, go ahead. Uh, through the chair to the proponent, uh, sorry, I'm, I, I'm missing your name. What, what's Sweet Pal? Sweet, Sweet Pal was just talking. Sweet Pal, um, do you have, would, is, that, is there any concern that you would have with meeting with the Planning and Development Committee one more time, but at the site? Uh, and then we would just table this tonight and bring it back to the next council meeting so that the, the planning and development committee and staff could meet you on site and have a, a discussion. I'm very open for any discussion uh, and uh, that might be, uh, I'm available personally, I'll fly in or drive whatever works, I'm comfortable. Uh, might be uh, tra the traffic impact, uh, Sean or Mark could be available virtually uh, because of COVID uh, restrictions, or, but I'm very open. Uh, the only request is uh, there have been uh, supply chain issues and we have been dealing back and forth uh, since January uh, for this property. Uh, there are certain items which have been ordered and we were looking at as per the zoning bylaws and that, that this should be very straightforward. And we completely understand and realize the concerns raised by the community and those have to be addressed. We're just looking for a uh, development permit so we can start with that process. Uh, you can put in some conditions uh, that subject to further details, uh, but if that helps, then I can put the fuel tanks in the ground. It's November. Uh, the weather won't help me afterwards. And also the supply chain uh, with the COVID won't help us. Uh, it would be a big re chain reaction. So this is where it's a very humble request that yes, as in past meetings, I've said I'm very open to work uh, with uh, all the questions, concerns, so that we can make a informed decision. Uh, at this point of time, I'm just requesting that most of the things we are trying to do is here are below ground and especially the tanks, um, uh, which were ordered. And if I miss it, uh, it's gonna push it way back to uh, like at least six to seven months because of COVID. And it's a huge investment. We looked at the zoning bylaws. We looked at what is approved in this property. And that's how we proceeded with it. Uh, we have submitted environmental studies. We have submitted traffic impact assessments. We honestly, like we have tried to do whatever is possible. And those reports are not done by Sweetpal. Those reports are done by professionals who are Canadian certified. and whatever has been possible. So technically, if we go follow the rules, we have complied with everything. And I'm happy to comply with this request as well. But at this point of time, my humble request is like, I'm in October 27 today. Uh, there are certain times only you can open the ground. Go ahead, Gord. Through the chair, yeah, Sweet Pal, um, yeah, it's Gord Bushel. I sit on the planning committee as well, and uh, yeah, we uh, we just had too many unanswered questions in the planning committee that uh, that we keep coming back to, and uh, now we've seem to have a fairly big push from the residents of Sycamus. So there's just some unanswered questions in regards to the traffic study, 
and just the way the phasing is going on. So an on-site uh, meeting would be very, uh, you know, beneficial for us so that we can, uh, we can, you know, put the taxpayers at ease. Um, if you want to say, I guess you want to say, or the council at ease. So that's what we're requesting is see, to see if we could meet, even if you can't meet, if your planner, well, your planner, your traffic uh, study person could meet us. Uh, in I'm, the next happy. Couple I'm happy. Let me know. I'll be there. I'm happy to meet. And that's what I said. I'm very happy to meet. And if uh, Sean uh, or Mark can, then we can have them virtually, but tell me the date and I'll be there. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, I think we're pretty much available all next, anytime next week, you know, uh, uh, starting Monday, I think. This week. This week, even this week, if we can. I mean, I do have a couple meetings both days, but as long as we're not conflicting. Uh, this week, I'm in Edmonton uh, market, uh, but Monday or Tuesday, uh, I'll, I'll be available. So most likely Tuesday would be the best day uh, because I have a five-year-old and I have uh, some doctor commitments with her uh, appointments. So Tuesday, I'll be there. Tuesday works for us. Thank you very much for your consideration. And so I'd like to make a motion to table this. Now, go ahead, Jen. Uh, that development permit application 21211 DP for the property located at 530 Main Street be referred back to the Planning and Development Committee for consideration and that an effort be made by the committee to meet the proposed on site to discuss the proposed development in relation, uh, relation to development permit guidelines. Does that work? That works. Thank you very much. Moved by Councillor Malmas, seconded by Councillor Bushel. Any other questions on this? Go ahead, Colleen. Um, because we've had so many concerns from uh, um, the general public about the Main Street, this particular Main Street property, and it is the head of our Main Street. It is the gateway to the Okanagan. It's the gateway to the Shushwap. So there is a lot of pushback for um, this business um, being developed there. And if perhaps when you're talking to the developer, if you could share some of the the letters or the information that we're getting back from the community, perhaps there's something that that could be done to work together to uh, satisfy the, the, the community as well as um, council. And like I said, it is the gateway to Sycamus. And um, I understand a lot of their concerns, especially with um, uh, having a, a, a gas station there, which is, um, it's getting a little archaic building gas stations, I would say, as we're moving to a electric electric world. Um, fast food uh, is, it's a roadblock. It's not inviting uh, to our community. It's, it doesn't drive people down Main Street of our community. It just redirects them. So there are a lot of concerns from uh, the community. So if we could um, address some of those with the developer, perhaps we can come to some sort of compromise or he can look at, you know, perhaps a new fresh look thanks thanks thank colleen so what we're going to do is uh, we'll have our corporate officer um uh email you we'll co coordinate a uh, specific time on tuesday uh, uh, for you to meet and uh you can meet the planning committee and uh, thank you for listening to us and our concerns and uh we'll see where the conversation goes when we have the on-site visit thank you thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Did we get that? So, uh, uh, we have a mover and a seconder. All in favor? I have a question. Councillor McKee. All right. Development variant permit application 21316 DVP. Scott, uh, before I read out the recommendation, would you give us a report on this one as well as Greg Darrell's property? I can, thank you, Chair. So this is the application for a development variance permit. <clears throat> it's on uh, Hillier Road, um, and it's to vary the setbacks for um, all buildings and then accessory residential buildings. Um, Council previously saw this application uh, or an application on this property um, in April. 
Um, at that time, there was a development permit issued and a development variance permit issued for the uh, development of a, of a mobile home park. Um, Greg Darrow um, is the applicant, and I believe he is on the line if Council has any questions for him. Um, so here's a photo of the property. As you can see where it is, it's across the street from uh, Toys for Boys, um, existing Strata Mobile Home Park. Then this would be uh, a mobile home park that uh, would have uh, an owner and then people would rent the pads. Uh, the roads have been uh, roughed in, I guess. Um, they're still waiting for BC Hydro and uh, and paving. The one building permit has been issued, and I think we have five or six more building permits that are waiting to be issued. Um, so this application is to vary the uh, the setbacks from the the property lines. Um, this is a little table showing basically the setback. So right now from the, the parent parcel line, so not the parcel lines within the, the mobile home park, not the mobile home site park, mobile home home site lines. <laughs> not those lines, these are the parent parcel lines for from six meters to four meters. Um, we thought four meters was uh, pretty reasonable. Um, the one that has the most concern would be the setback from Hillier Road. Um, and then the, um, the setbacks for assessor buildings right now, they're six meters from all property lines. Um, and the proposal is to go to four meters from the front property line and the exterior side property line, and then one and a half meters from the, the front and rear property lines. Um, the reason that uh, we're recommending, uh, we recommended four meters for accessory buildings and all buildings from the front part property line, that's the, the one in common with Hillier Road. And um, just with uh, the boulevard there and servicing it, and then for aesthetic reasons, um, there's also some green space that's required um, around the mobile home park as well. Um, so that that was actually varied at the um, by the last variance permit. But yeah, there's still that requirement for that buffering, and then the the setbacks for the accessory buildings from uh, a parcel line you'd share with a neighbor would be one and a half meters, which is um, standard. Um, we set this out to for uh, referrals, um, no objections from uh, the building inspection, bylaw enforcement, or engineering. Fire department did have some concerns. Um, you know, as you know, mobile home parks are often quite dense as they are, and as you start adding um, units and then bigger units, and then people put decks and people put accessory buildings. Um, just the the ability to fire fight a fire uh, becomes more and more difficult. At the building permit stage, um, the building official looks at fire separation between buildings, um, but the and so that that you know addresses the spread of fire from one building to the other. But what the fire department's concerned about is you know getting a person <laughs> in between those buildings if there is a fire. So th those are the concerns from the, the fire department. Um, staff's recommending that uh, these development variance permit be issued. Um, I think we have. Um, enough assurance with uh, the setback being four meters from the, the front or any exterior side lines. And then uh, and then it's really consistent with, uh, with the development of mobile home park and consistent with the, the property next door. Thank you, Scott. Um, so this came to the planning committee today and it was uh, supported for uh, Councillor's information. So I'll open the floor. Is there any comments or questions before I read the resolution? Okay. So recommendation that the district of Sycamus authorize an issue development variance permit number 21-316 DVP for the property legally described as lot A, section six, township 22, range seven, west of the sixth Meridium Kamloop Division Yale District Plan EPP 98605 located at Hillier Road, east to varied District of Sikkim was zoning bylaw number 101-1993, section 6033B setbacks and section 6034A setbacks for accessory residential buildings moved by Councillor Malma, seconded by Councillor Bushnell. Any other comments or questions on this? Call the question, all those in favor? Carried unanimously, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Okay, September 2021 financial report, recommendation that Council establish a select financial com committee for the purpose of 2022 budget deliberations with all council members appointed to the select committee and Councilor Anderson, would you accept the position yes. as chair? All right. 
and Councillor Anderson as chair, and that the Select Finance Committee meeting at 9 a.m. on November 24th to December 2nd to November 24th, December 1st and 8th, 2021 in council chambers. I need a mover on this. Councillor Arish, Councillor Malmas. Any comments? Okay, call a question all in favor. Carried unanimously. Thank you, Colleen. I don't make up the, <laughs> the report well to speak to. Go ahead, Kelly. You can report on this. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I will be really brief. This is just a snapshot of our uh, financials for the nine months uh, ending September uh, 30th, 2021. Uh, broken, broken it out into a few different things. So we have the general fund, which uh, we are on track. Our revenues are relatively consistent with last year. We've collected most of our revenues because it's primarily taxation revenues. Um, two things I'd like to point out is our provincial grants is a little uh, more than last year by a couple hundred thousand because we received a one-time payment, um, a, a bonus grant, if you will, from the Community Works Fund, which I'm moving into a reserve to be spent on future projects. Um, and in addition, our licenses, fees and permits is a little bit up and that's because of uh, additional work um, happening in the Development Services Department. In terms of expenses in the general fund, we're also a little up here, um, but very consistent with expectations. It's mainly uh, protective services. So where's protective services here? Uh, yes, here. And that is much higher because of work uh, during the two mile uh, fire in July and August, as well as we had additional costs for sending fire, um, various fire um, department members out to the province for work. We have just finished doing a bill which is not incorporated in here and we will re we'll be receiving just over 315, 315,000 back from the province for work that we performed. So that goes back into the fire department reserve. So we actually um, make, make money when we go out uh, to fight fires with the province. So that's coming back. And um, another place where it's a little higher is public health and welfare. It's higher than last year, but lower than budget. And this is because of uh, June 1st, we acquired the Sycamuse Medical Clinic, which is now the Sycamuse Community Health Center. And so those costs are in there as well as some operating costs for the, the daycare. Otherwise, our, uh, our expenses are definitely in line with budget and uh, there's no concerns there with the general fund. Uh, moving on to the water and sewer, which are always very exciting for people to hear about. I know our billing, er, everything's in line with our expectations for the water and sewer fund, uh, nothing unusual. The only difference is our long-term debt uh, repayment is a little lower uh, than this time last year. And that's just due to timing of payment. We made a payment beginning of October this year. Last year, it was the end of, of September for the water and sewer fund. So it looks like we have uh, deficits here, but that's only because the majority of our billing is done in um, six months of it, which is the highest usage is done, and we don't receive it until January, which we'll record at the end of the year. So it should all work out at the end of the year. Um, also, here is a snapshot of our capital projects. I'm not going to go into it in detail. Uh, you can take a look at it. We have um, spent uh, in total 3.7 million of the 10.9 million of capital projects. Wastewater treatment plant upgrades is a large one, as well as uh, the majority is the Solstice Sycamus Bridge. Um, and then, of course, the beach park washrooms. Uh, Talk, speaking about the bridge, this is a more detailed budget of the bridge, which I do every quarter just to make sure that we're in line with the, the our original budget. So as you can see, our engineering is a, over budget, but our contract price is under, uh, under budget. So as we move along, uh, we will see how this sh uh, shakes out. But I've been told to keep the budget at 5.6 million. So that is what we're doing. And then I have a few other uh, little schedules which are new. So I've got some new lovely financial schedules which are the new community projects. So these are just a closer look of uh, new projects taken on by the district this year. Uh, so these are things that we have acquired last year or early this year, which is the Hockey Academy, the daycare building, not the operations, we don't operate it, we just own the building. 
um, as well as the community health center. So I broke this out um, just in a little bit more detail for your information and if you have any questions. So the, and to note all of these uh, three things, these are all being, um, any deficit incurred from these are being funded uh, by grant funding over the next five years. So, so the taxpayer is not actually incurring the, these deficits, they are grant funded. Um, so this is, what are we, the Hockey Academy, we received two months worth of rent, uh, some minor expenses. So we, we're at a surplus right now of 3,000. However, we did just pay a lump sum $80,000 for the debt on the Hockey Academy. So that surplus will quickly move into a deficit here, but that is within budget and within expectations. So that's the Hockey Academy. Uh, the daycare building, um, just uh, just uh, under $6,000 of, of operating expenses, nothing too unusual there. Uh, the budget was $17,000, so we will definitely be in under budget there for the daycare building. And then more um, exciting is the Community Health Centre. Uh, this is a new venture for the District of Sycamus, and we're unsure how things are going to shake out, but very happy the doctors are doing a, a great job of seeing patients and billing MSP of which we get to retain a portion of that to cover our overhead costs. So we will definitely exceed revenues for the health center because this is for nine months. However, we've only been operating it since June. So it's really actually a much smaller portion. Um, so so our, our deficit is right now lower than what we had budgeted, but we'll see how the year year shakes out. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details here. Um, our biggest <coughs> expense is uh, payments to physicians because we keep a, a portion of what they bill and we pay the physicians um, the remainder. And then this uh, acquisition of medical, clinic, cl um, medical equipment, to, new to us, there was some dated equipment. We needed to upgrade some of the equipment there so the doctors can do what they need to do. Uh, and with that, I am happy to answer any questions or concerns you may have. Questions for Kelly. Good job, Kelly. Oh. <laughs> Good job, Kelly. All right, thank you for that. We did pass the resolution, so we're good to go. Saskia 75th anniversary legacy artwork project at Beach Park. Recommendation that the mayor and corporate officer be authorized to execute the agreement with Salmon Arm Savings Credit Union and David Jacob Harder Art and Design for the installation of an art project at Beach Park. I need a mover on this. Councillor Anderson seconded by Councillor McCabe. All right, Jen, you wanna give us a little bit of a briefing on this? Uh, certainly, uh, through the chair, uh, just to remind council, it was at March 24th regular council meeting that council resolved to support the installation of an art piece at Beach Park. This is a, a donation to the district from uh, Seven Arm Savings Credit Union. Um, and so the agreement that's before you now is just to, to finalize that. It is a three-party agreement. It's between us, Saskia, and the artist. And so staff have reviewed the agreement um, from an operational and from a liability standpoint, and uh, we have no concerns. Um, and so uh, acceptance of this donation following the execution of this agreement um, would be in line with our donation policy. I don't know if there's any questions from council on the agreement. Go ahead, Jeff. Not actually on the agreement. I mean. Uh... What's this going to look like? It's, so it's 10 by 10 by 12 tall. <laughs> we do have a sneak peek. Kelly can bring it up. That was um, posted on their website. So the artist will work uh, and it's going to be in phase and they're going to respond to what Sasky wants. We actually don't get much of a say in what the art will look like because it's a donation to us. So this is a preliminary, what he submitted as part of his, uh, in response to the expression of interest. This is what he submitted. Um, of course, it's a donation to us. We don't really have much say in um, what the art will be. But he has worked with other municipalities. He's worked with Kelowna. Um, Kelly might be able to speak more to the art selection process. Yeah, he actually worked. Uh, he did these type of larger um, people uh, in, in uh, Richmond. And what this is, is actually, it's two large people, but there's a bunch of other little within the large people, <laughs> if you will. Uh, and the apples uh, or, uh, 
will be also multifunctional for seating. So it can be used multi people can somewhat engage with it. Um, yeah, but, but he definitely, the, the proponent has worked with probably 20 different municipalities on artwork. So I think the credit union staff, the district staff, Daryl from operations uh, will make sure that it's a durable, you know, can, can be minimal vandalized and will still look good. Thank you, Bob, you had a question? Yeah, I, I attended an online meeting about this in September, as you asked me to, and uh, we went over several different ideas. We chose one that was, well, didn't choose it. I, we recommended that whatever it was, and this is one of the more solid ones that wouldn't be vandalized as easily and fall apart. People losing their heads, fake people losing their heads. <laughs> I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay, moving back, um, uh, there was a question in regards to funding the healing center. Um, that was brought as an late item on the agenda. Kevin, can you give us some comments on that? Councilor McCabe? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Just uh, checking my uh, email here because I sent myself a reminder. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get support from from council to ask staff to um, apply for some additional funding. As one of the folks was in the galley was asking if we had enough funding, we do. We can make it work with what we have. But if we get more, we can make it more sustainable by maybe having a adding geothermal to it or um, maybe additional funding for the for the building itself. Um, so I was thinking. A couple different funding sources, one for the geothermal as a separate standalone application, but to reapply to our original funding sources, both provincial and federal, um, it may have never, will probably be set a new precedent for doing this. And the worst thing they can do is say no. But I think in light of uh, our application for this $5.95 million grant was um, pre COVID. And so since COVID, uh, we know COVID is impacting, like we've heard earlier today, uh, supply chains and the supply chain impacts schedule and schedules impact costs. Our original estimate, I think was a, I'm not positive, but I think it was a class D. Now that we have an architect on board, we, we don't have any preliminary designs or plans, but with, uh, with COVID in place, I think uh, with a new government in place, and the federal government has a new ministry that's uh, new. It's a mental health and addictions ministry. I think that's a potential funding source. But uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that we that's council we'll ask staff to go back to our original funders, and because uh, our application was prior to COVID and prior to uh, also um, residential schools finding un unmarked graves, which has, has brought the uh, truth and reconciliation more to the forefront and we want to make sure we get this right as far as truth and reconciliation goes and we don't want lack of funding to impact the quality of service that the final product uh, uh, delivers so i'm asking support from council to ask staff to apply to our original funders for additional funding probably two million or so we'll leave that with the staff and also a separate funding application for uh, to make it sustainable, maybe with geothermal or or, or uh, solar or a combination of both, or however that might look uh, as a separate additional funding source, and and multiple applications maybe to uh, use the same one. I'm not asking for staff to do a lot of extra work, but to um, the new federal ministry, a ministry of. Uh, uh, mental health and addictions, I think it's called. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anyhow, uh, if we can get support from council, ask staff to um, start work on, on some grant applications to increase the funding for our shoe shop healing center so we can make it uh, a better product for locals and regional service and more sustainable. 
staff is aware, and also in the conversation we had with Mel Arnold, uh, anything that he sees that will be able to assist us financially uh, when it comes to uh, the healing center, uh, he's going to do some research uh, with the federal government as well. Uh, we had that conversation with uh, Kelly and uh, Jen and myself and Mel and his uh, assistant and uh, and uh, he's uh, he's on board trying to find us some additional means when it comes to grant funding from the federal side. So do I have the support from council to ask staff to do that? Yep. I need a resolution for that. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the extra work there, big guy. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, High Mountain Development, is there any additional information that we got when it comes to the CSRD and the High Mountain? Development. Um, I haven't heard any more from the CSRD's point of view, but Evan, yourself, Colleen, could we? Um, could I suggest that we get some maybe staff can do a little bit of digging to see what's going on at Hyde Mountain? Further to that, I will ask uh, Greg Darrow, who we dealt with earlier tonight. Um, Greg's familiar with the community. He's part of the consulting team. Maybe he can do a presentation to council Greg. and bring the consulting team and what they have applied to the CSRD in terms of their plans. Um, I've seen some preliminary designs which are public because they've been submitted to the CSRD, but I don't think the public or this council has seen them. So let's invite the, the team and present it to council as, a, as an information item. Okay. I can tell you they're doing work at Hyde Mountain. Yeah, they've got big plans. Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, my, my question's more related to the marina, considering the yep. 900. Um, yep, and I'll ask, I'll ask for that, you bet. Thanks. Find the dynamics around the rail trail crossing agreement too. All right, we'll move on, thanks. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Motion at 12A notices of motion, all head mountain motor vehicle closure, Gauntra Bushel. There's a recommendation that the district compose a letter to the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resources Operations and Rural Development regarding concerns with the proposed mo motor vehicle closure on Owl Head Mountain. And we should copy MLA Greg Kylo and MP Mel Arnold on this as well. I have a mover on this. Councillor Pushel, Councillor Anderson. Or do you want to comment on this? I can just search. Yes, uh, through the chair, um, I'm not sure if everybody knows that uh, just recently the province has handed down some closures for the uh, for the backcountry, and uh, they are going to close the areas that were uh, um, uh, that had the forest fires on them. So that's not just here in Sycamus. It's there's a number of them all over the province. And one of the ones that's going to close our main hill here is Owlhead parking lot or Owlhead uh, Hill. And the problem is, is that the fire actually went uh, where the fire is, is not where we snowmobile. Uh, you actually have to drive your snowmobile and your groomers on a logging road through the fire area. So you're on the logging road, you're not off the logging road, but you get up top in the Alpine and then you go to the area where you snowmobile. But the closure is right now is completely closed unless you get an exemption so what we're doing is we're asking for an exemption uh first off you know we feel and so does the bc snowmobile federation and uh, eagle valley snowmobile club that snowmobiling does not harm any any of the you know when you any of the, the ground disturbed uh after a fire but that's for the biologists and, the, and everybody to uh contend with what we're asking is uh, an exemption just for the snowmobile season, because this closure is 18 months, which is basically two snowmobile seasons. And, uh, you know, we were hit with the, with the fires this summer and COVID last winter, you know, and I mean, Owlhead is our biggest hill. So the Eagle Valley Snowmobile Club is really concerned that if we don't get an exemption, uh, I mean, they'll all go to Revy and they'll all go to Belmont or whatever, and it, it'll impact the, the community. I did hand out a, a, a economic impact study that was just done by the Eagle Valley Snowmobile Club by a, a, a well-known um, economic in, um, a company that does these impact studies. They did one for the BC Snowmobile Federation, which uh, brought in um, the, the province, the provincial province uh, uh, brings in 
$299 million to the BC economy for snowmobiling. And then, uh, so, so we'd had one done for Sycamus and uh, it brings in uh, for the province $9.1 million or economic benefit to Sycamus is five point, I think it's 5.9, I think it is, some, or 5.6 economic development for Sycamus. And that includes the restaurants and the hotels and the sled shops and everything else that goes along with it. So we're just asking for a support letter. Uh, Jen was very good at putting together a letter and uh, our MLA, Greg Kylo, has also put together a letter to the Minister of Tourism, Arts, Councils and Sports. Um, uh, our letter is gonna go to, I hope it's gonna go to Katrina Conroy. She's, our, uh, she's an MLA and she's a Minister of Forest and Natural Resources. So I'm not sure if you had time to look at uh, the letter, but it, it's very well done. Um, if anybody has any tweets or anything, um, you know, we, we don't have, we can make changes later, but if you have any, any, any thoughts on it, you could maybe send it to Jen or myself and, and we'd like to get it out fairly soon because it is time sensitive. And uh, yeah, just wanted to hear your guys' comment on it. Yeah, I think this is a great letter and um, I'm totally in support of this as uh, the Snowmobile Club written the District of Sycamus a letter. As of yet, to, uh, regarding their yes. concerns, yeah, the Snowmobile Club has written the uh, a letter. BC Snowmobile Federation has written a letter. Um, Greg Kylo has written a letter. Uh, Mel Arnold knows about it. I'm not sure if he's going to be sending a letter, but uh, yeah, uh, you bet. All right, it's a big concern for all the all the Snowmobile clubs that are in. The letter. And, uh, even if we get an exemption for the winter, all we're asking. I mean, the exemption that we're going to ask for is even if we can just stay on the trail on an, an actual, it's an actual forestry service road and uh, we could sign it, um, you know, just, just to get us, keep the, keep the ball rolling and keep the economy going in the wintertime for the restaurants and hotels and businesses. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, comments or questions from council? Councilor Anderson. Would it be beneficial for businesses and uh, restaurants and all the people associated with the snow with the snowmobile industry to, to write as well? Yeah, it, it all helps. It all helps. Uh, we could put together a little thing or get the chamber or uh, the snowmobile company to put, a, put together the list of names of where the letters can go. Yeah, we can do that. I think that would be a good idea just to get a form letter and have people sign off on it. Okay. All right, any other comments or questions? Thanks very much for that, Mr. Bushel. That's seriously concerning to the District of Sycamus and for that matter, other jurisdictions as well. All right, I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor, carried unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, okay, correspondence. Uh, correspondence for Action, District of Sycamus Development Corp. Recommendation that the district provide office space at 217 Finlayson to the District of Sycamus Development Corp. at no cost and provide public notice as per the community charter. Do I have a mover on this? Councillor Evans, second by Councillor Anderson. Okay. Carly, do you want to speak on behalf of this? I got your name up here. Sure, if there's anybody has any questions. You've been waiting very, very patiently and let's see what kind of support you have. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Finisher. If there's any questions from any councillors, um, if you have a chance to read the letter, I would like for your time in, in taking a look at my request and does anybody have any questions? Go ahead, Councillor McCabe. Where's 2A? Uh, so that is the unused office space right directly above the medical clinic right now. Oh, the parking there. Thanks. All right. Any other comments or questions? Councilor Bushel. Yeah, through the chair. Yeah, just a comment. I think it's a. I think it's a great idea that you, we get out and stand alone. Uh, we get it set up and maps on the wall and uh, businesses that we need and you know get a list going. And I think it's a great. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Going to have more room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, uh, I have a very aggressive plan for the business community and second moves next year. So I think that the additional space will allow for more of the um, resource and support of workshops and sessions with uh, experts that I would like to bring in to support the community and, and give them that opportunity to access those resources. All right, thanks. 
Coach Anderson. I think it's a great idea. Thank you, Carly. Thanks for all the hard work you do. And I think it's also good that the ECDEF board get together and be able to drop in and, and look at those, you know, maps and ideas and thoughts. I mean, step on the wall is a thought generator, right? So yeah. it's, yeah. Thank you. Coach Ramalmas, go ahead. Uh, through the chair. So you, you use the word additional space. Does that mean you're keeping the space where you're at as well? No, sorry, just said, um, I guess that was the wrong way to phrase it. No, I would be moving um, into the new space. Up okay, because I, I was going, we're going to still pay rent someplace else that we're going to give. Okay, that's good. All right. Any other comments? I'm going to call a question. All those in favor, heard unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Carly. Thanks, Carly. Really. Correspondence fraction, uh, mountain bike bus service, recommendation that a letter of support be provided to mountain man bikes bus service regarding a proposed bus service route through Sycamore. I need a mover on this. Councilor Aries, seconded by Councilor Malmas. Comments or questions on this? Straightforward. Okay, let's go. Cool. I'll, uh, through the chair, I'll talk about it for a minute since I had a look at Mountain Man Mike's website. Um, is, <laughs> is, uh, he, he's based out of the Kootenays and um, it's owned by uh, this fellow. I, I don't think his last name is Mike, but uh, is his first that's, a, that's a joke. Yeah, obviously Mike from the mountains. Uh, and I think his first bus was ran on vegetable oil that he was getting from, from restaurants and stuff. It's a, a neat uh, independent operation. And hopefully, um, I think we should be excited to um, offer them a letter of support and hope that things work out well for them. All right. I totally support this as well. All right. Any other comments on this? Okay. I'll call a question. All those in favor? Okay. All right. Uh, in regards to uh, correspondence for information, uh, as far as the list is concerned, anybody want to speak on any of these at this particular stage? Uh, Jennifer Whiteside, Minister of Education, regarding the premium awards, uh, and Kelsey Turner in regards to tax dollars. Comments, Councilor Anderson. I um I just want to address the um, tax dollars. There's a couple of them here. Uh, I think, and the information is incorrect that that they received. The um, the Eagles did not receive tax dollars for the new space to uh, dry their clothes when they come back from away games. That was a donation by a, a private resident. So um, I just wanted to clarify that. But I also wanted to just mention to PAC, um, we've been through this before where the elementary school was in, you know, on shaky grounds and council rushed in and rallied around the school district and we got to keep our elementary school. Then a couple of years later, I think um, PAC came to us and they needed some playground equipment. So I think we made a donation to that. So I guess my ask with these two letters would be if the PAC wants some money from the district of Sycamus. And we support, you know, we, and we will support the Eagles because they're part of our community, but we also support the elementary school. So if you'd like to come in as a delegation, let us know what you're looking for. Let us know what you've already um, um, funded. And perhaps we can build it into our next budget, our financial meetings coming up and look at some, some financial support for you as well. But, um, yeah, just get together a delegation and come in with a plan and we're more than happy to listen to you. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, Evan. Yeah, I do thank the uh, the two letters addressed to us on behalf of the residents on this, this hockey academy. Um, I touched on this a month ago. Um, the hockey academy, for the lack of a better name, is a facility purchased and owned by the District of Sycamus to assist any user group to come to Sycamus and participate in sport, whether it's summertime, Finlayson Park, wintertime, the, the rec center. The entire point of building this facility was to encourage tournaments and provide housing to umpires, players, both summer and winter. Sycamus Eagles are a tenant. Um, the facility wasn't built per se for the Eagles 
at its initial stage. This was a concept we looked at to bring a, another hockey academy to town and that the revenues on an annual basis would help pay for this piece of infrastructure. But more importantly, what I want to address is this facility was also built in the anticipation of the District of Sycamore submitting an RFP, a proposal to manage and operate the rec center. That was rejected by the CSRD. And in that decision, and what Wayne Marsh says when it says it's not necessary, he's talking about the dressing room. He's talking about the facility that we're gonna add on to the academy that's been paid for by a very generous donor in the community, not the taxpayer. What Wayne Marsh is referring to is under the old system where the rec society ran the rec center, there was space available for the Sycamus Eagles to hang their equipment. Since the new ownership took over, which is privately run, Nestadia, they have decided, based on COVID reasons, that the Sycamus Eagles are not allowed to hang their jerseys on road games. So when they come off the bus, they are no longer allowed inside the arena. So that forced the Eagles to find a home to dry their equipment. And currently, Public Works and Daryl's team is providing space on a temporary basis, the building behind the Hockey Academy, to address that. So this new facility that's going to be added on, the dressing room, I call it the closet, is being funded by a private donor. But my frustration, and shared by all of council, is why would the rec center take away something that they've offered the Eagles since 1994? That's a question to Nastadia. And it has placed the Eagles at risk of you know, losing their competitive spirit where there are other communities looking for a, a junior B hockey team. This is a community owned team. It's a society. And so that's why council has decided to go ahead and support the rec center by building this facility, inviting all tournaments, whether it's summer, winter, fall, or spring. This summer, for example, we house firefighters from across the province of BC. Those firefighters through emergency uh, BC provided revenues back to the district when we open those doors to firefighters. So it's more than just the Eagles. But again, you know, I challenge Nastadia to explain why a tenant, a class A tenant since 1994, can't have a dedicated space provided for them in the arena. So with that answer being no, we then turn to a donor who came forward and said, I'll pay for it. And that's what's happened right now. So I wanna clarify that and thank the two letters coming forward because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for um, correcting a lot of misinformation out there. And that starts with the two letters, so thank you. Well, I hope that uh, that answers some of the concerns regarding uh, these letters. Uh, also, the complex was uh, used to house um, firefighters during our wildfire service. And so there's more, uh, there's more uh, use for that particular facility than just sports groups as well. So um, I can see the concerns here. I respect them as well, but I think that uh, they just need to know what uh, you know, we're up against sometimes. And, and uh, I have to say that the Sycamus Eagles hockey team, since its uh, inception, has been extremely important to the District of Sycamus. You know, there's 150 to 200 people that go out to the games uh, and um, and uh, these kids do attend our high school and and maybe one day uh, some of them might stick here. So, and at the same time, it also has sparked some of the, uh, the professional hockey players that are now playing in the NHL. And, uh, um, you know, it's a great program. And, uh, 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 you know, it's, uh, it's about tax dollars being spelt on a, spent, spelt, spent on a hockey program, but, you know, um, which isn't really the case. Anyway, thanks for the letter. And um, any other comments on these letters at this stage? Okay. Then, that being said, I guess we are ready to move back into in camera because we haven't finished our camera. Uh, so, recommendation to pursue to section 91A, IJK, and 92D of the Community Charter Council Exercise Authority to move in camera. I need a mover. Councillor Malmes, Councillor Aries. Thanks to the gallery for being.